Helen made me care about the people in this book, and I wanted to know more about them, their future, and their families. And that gets us right into this, that you interviewed more than 100 people for this. How did you finally decide to focus on these four? Oh boy. Well, first can I just say thank you to the San Francisco Public Library and all of you for coming out here tonight on such a beautiful evening and to Sherry Hu for being such a dear friend and, and being willing to do this with me, and also to the 1990 Institute and Cora Yang for, for organizing this event. So thanks to all of you. And um, you know, for an author, especially when you do spend 12 years working on uh, a tome, um, you never know how it's going to come out, how it's going to be received. And so it's just so uh, amazing to, to see all of you and, and to, um, feel like I've touched people like Sherry and, and uh, a number of dear friends and readers here. Um, and as Sherry pointed out, I, I actually started this book, um, I had it on my mind for more than 12 years. It was something I, I had thought about for a long time because what I wrote about was a, an, a forgotten exodus, a story that I had heard from the time that I was a child. And the more I wanted to know about it, the, the more I found out that there was nothing. There is uh, not a single book in the English language, not a single dissertation or a master's thesis about this particular exodus in English. In Chinese, there are about three books, all in Taiwan, about the exodus to Taiwan. So my wanting to know about it was something that um, there was nothing for me to find, just tidbits, and that's why I undertook um, interviewing people, and actually I interviewed more than 100 survivors of this, I call them survivors, people who lived through this exodus, and I, and I know some of you are here this evening. Um, this is a World War II generation, mm -hmm. and I interviewed well over 100 other people, experts, professors, um, folks who specialize in uh, uh, China before World War II, World War II, after World War II, and Shanghai in particular, which UC Berkeley actually is quite um, noted for its Shanghai scholars. But these four in particular, their stories were so compelling that it, that it was just stunning and, and such rich detail. I mean, so out of the hundred, you narrowed it down to four? Was there a reason? There is a reason. Um, I have to say that telling a the story of more than 100 people is very difficult to do, even more than more than four people. It's really hard for a reader to track those stories, but there's a reason that I undertook this, and if you'll bear with me, I did want to share a personal piece of why I ended up doing this book, because um, I'm an ABC, and for the Chinese Americans in the room, you'll know that means I'm an American-born Chinese. When I was a child, bo in growing, born and raised in New Jersey, by the way, anybody else here from New Jersey? <laughs> oh, my brother Hoyt, he's also <laughs> from New Jersey. Of course you count. <laughs> and he's also not ashamed to admit that he's from New Jersey. The rest of you, I know you're out here. But, um, but uh, our father said to my mother when she was, um, uh, when we were in diapers, he said, don't speak Chinese to the children. Why? Because that was the height of the McCarthy period. It was a time that my father knew that Chinese were um, being looked at as potential spies as a fifth column in the US. And so he thought that as children, we would be discriminated against if we spoke Chinese. Now, as an adult, I know that that wasn't going to happen. And I regret that he had said that to my mother. But I never thought that I was the right person to do this research, even though I, I, I felt like there was a story that needed to be told because I don't speak Chinese, I don't read Chinese, and I, you know, in my mind, I really thought this should be done by somebody who is not only fluent in Mandarin, also fluent in Shanghainese, and fluent in old Shanghainese, which was spoken in the 1930s and 1940s, and who could read both simplified and traditional Chinese um, texts. But there was an even better reason why you were the most yeah. qualified well, to write this book. 
So, so if you don't, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read a short passage, which is why I took this up. And one of the four characters that Sherry mentions, um, all of the four began, I start in 1937 when they were children. And so this is a story of one of the characters who was uh, at six years old in 1936. And she was about to go on a trip with her father and was very excited about doing that, this six-year-old, who was only known as a little sister at the time. Baba, her father, Baba announced that he would take little sister on a train ride to Suzhou, 60 miles away toward Shanghai. She remembered every moment of that journey, for she had been giddy that Baba had chosen her, not one of her brothers. She sat on her father's lap, her eyes glued to the window, mesmerized by the neat rice fields and towns just like hers, sweeping by in a blur. When they arrived in Suzhou, she saw men and women dressed in fine silk fabrics and even in foreign outfits, unlike her mother and father, who wore roughly woven traditional dress. Big posters showed pretty ladies with curly black hair wearing tight cheap house, promoting cigarettes, mosquito coils, and rat poison. When they reached the station, Baba flagged down the driver of a wooden moon-wheeled cart. After a twisty, bumpy ride over arched stone bridges and canals lined by weeping willows, they finally came to a stop at a small store. Inside, her father spoke to the shopkeepers in a low voice while she stood waiting by the door, looking out at the parade of vendors and hawkers on the street. Soon Baba called for her and told her to stand still by him. The shopkeepers looked into her mouth and squeezed her thin arms. When they were finished poking and prodding her, one of them took her hand and led her to another room. As she turned to look for her father, she saw his back as he headed out the door. Baba, Baba, she had shouted after him. He didn't turn around. Baba, come back, she cried. How could he leave without her? The stranger gently pushed her into a small, dark storeroom and locked the door. Alone and terrified of what might lurk in the darkness, at first she could only whimper. Then she steeled herself and called for her father as hard as she could until she grew hoarse and couldn't shout anymore. Exhausted, she sobbed herself to sleep. When the little girl awakened on the musty excuse me, on the musty dirt floor, she thought she had had a terrible nightmare. But when she tried to open the door, it wouldn't budge. She could see the glare of daylight around the cracks. Once again, she screamed for her father. Baba never came. And so I heard this story um, about 15, 16 years ago, and it was told to me by my mother. And she was the little girl. And she was already well into her 70s, and she had never told anyone. I had never heard this before. I had grown up wondering about what life was like in China, um, because in New Jersey, people would always say, go back where you came from. And when I said, New Jersey, I'm here, um, they meant China. So I would ask my mother, um, what was life like for you as a little girl growing up in China? And my mother always said, uh, that was wartime, a bad memory. And that was all she would ever say. So I never knew anything until this moment when I was having dinner with my mother, um, actually in Rossmore in Walnut Creek. And that childhood mantra just sort of popped into my mouth when I was um, you know, just trying to make conversation with my mom. And I said, gee, mom, too bad you can't tell me about your childhood when you were a little girl in China. <laughs> you know, something that an adult child would stupidly say, and she looked at me that evening and she said, all right, you want to know, I'll tell you. And so this was the first story she told me, and I was in total shock. I had never known this, and of course, even as adults, you know, from the time we're children, we have a, a family narrative, a story that our parents tell us about, you know, our story, our families, our history that they hope will make us stronger people, and that's why they don't tell us stories like these. And, and so... Um, what happened after she finally released and told you this story? 
was it part of a healing process for her? And 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 you and Hoyt and the other siblings must have been. Oh, we shocked. were in total. Uh, we couldn't believe it. I mean, my mother, when she told me the story, first said, "I'll tell you, but you can't tell anybody else." And I said, "Oh, okay, mom." And, and here then, it is in a book now. <laughs> right, right. Now it's now it's in the book. Um, but by the end of the story, and this was just the beginning, I mean, you can imagine she had been given away just as the uh, invasion by Japan and the full-blown World War II was going to begin. And, um, and so just her life, her very circuitous life from then on, I mean, she began to tell me. And so, and I began to ask lots of questions. But by the end of this evening, I said, is it all right if I tell my siblings your other children? And she paused to think about it, and she said, yeah, okay. So I got on the phone that night and, and, and called every one of my siblings. You know, there were six of us, so. And we were all in a state of shock. Um, we had no idea. When I told my sister, she started crying, you know, just knowing that this had been my mother's life and her early beginnings. Um, but what was so shocking was that she had kept the story a secret all her life. And it wasn't until she was in her 70s. And I imagine that if I had not just blurted that question out that night, she might never have told me. Because um, what happened was after a few years went by, and I mean, every time I saw my mother after that, I would just be asking her another question, another question, tell me more. And then what happened? And what did you say to this person? And why do you think this happened? And why are you telling this now? And she would say, my father gave me away because I was a girl, number one. And, um, and when I said to her, mom, your memory is so good. <laughs> like, what another smart thing to say. She said, I was six years old. I remember every detail because that was the worst day of my life. And so she was very clear with all of these details, and her memory was remarkable, but as I heard the details, I was like, you would remember. Everyone here would remember these things that happened to them. Well, and as she told them, I could feel she grew lighter. I mean, I told my siblings, so then they would ask her questions. Um, I have two nephews here, Rory and Mitchell, and when they would ask their grandmother questions, she was so happy, actually, to be telling her grandchildren these stories who did reports about their grandmother and you could feel that every time she told it was a kind of a release of that shame that she held because there was so so much stigma especially of that generation of having been abandoned of then being adopted later and all of those things then when did you decide to tell her you were going to write a book about this well not long after that, I mean, I, I did ask my mother. I mean, you know, um, she knew I was asking her a lot of questions, and by then I had already written two books. She probably guessed knowing you. And, and she, it was, I could feel liberating for her to be able to tell these stories, stories that she had locked away for so long and never told anybody. And she had so much knowledge about the time and the history and what was going on in China and Shanghai. And so at some point, at some point, I guess, you know, being the daughter who was also the writer and the journalist, I, I, I really wanted to know more. I wanted to know the context of what had happened to my mother, was how, how unique was this for her, but what was also going on with other children of that time and other people in that time in, in Shanghai? Because as I said, there was really nothing for me to look up about it, nothing to read, and so, I began to do, uh, to find people. I mean, that was, that was a challenge in itself because, you know, there aren't any lists to go for. And I just began asking everybody I knew, do you know anybody who might have come from this time period in China who left as part of this exodus, who might have lived in Shanghai or passed through Shanghai or have some knowledge of this time? What's so fascinating, though, is that the details are so specific in each of the stories for Ho, for Benny, for Anwa. I mean, I can understand the trauma and, and a child remembering that, but I mean, there, there are really some horrifying specific details. Watching, watching war and seeing bodies in the street 
I think that was Benny's story. Every uh, as every as a, everybody who was a were, child in Shanghai they, saw bodies. Even on your the mother's story is she was racing to get to the ship to escape in that last ship mm -hmm. that That's right. uh, that someone in a pedicab almost hit her. Did people remember all Every single little detail that's in here, I mean, seriously, it is rich with detail. Once you read or if you have read, you will understand. This was such a tumultuous time in China. It was a time of, you know, world war, occupation by a terrible, cruel invader uh, enemy for eight years, eight long years. I mean, China fought World War II largely alone. Um, and for longer than any other country. And so the children, the young people, uh, well, not just the young people, but the people I was able to interview were young people at that time. The generation of their parents had already passed away. And, um, but those were times that nobody would forget. And so literally everybody I interviewed had the most incredible, heartbreaking but inspiring stories of things that they had witnessed um, and truly every everyone growing up as a child in most of China at in those years grew up seeing dead bodies knowing people who had been killed or bayoneted or uh, terrible things and the children in Shanghai there were so many beggars on the street that if a cold snap happened the next day there would be people who didn't make it and these kids would be told, if you see a dead body on the street on your way to school, look the other way or walk the other way. And so everybody, all of these more than 100 people, had stories about that and, you know, much more than that. But um, Then why the other three? What, what brought you to finally say, here, these are the ones whose stories will be immortalized in this book? So... Uh, Everybody had stories, but some had more than others. Some had amazing memories about um, the trajectory of their lives. And so as I began to think about a book describing this, um, this exodus, really, you know, we're talking about, it, it's, you know, the 1949 revolution, the liberation or the takeover of Shanghai, however you look at it, and of China. Um, but really, that's the story of modern China. And so I actually start the book in 1937. And if I had had my way with my editor, which I would have started it in 1911 and 1912, which was the fall of the Qing Dynasty and the beginning of the Republic of China. And But that was too much history for my editor. Thorough researcher. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I was looking for people. I, I actually, for the four people that I... I did use, I, I know their stories, I know their parents' stories, and I would have started with their parents, but because that would have been a 800-page book, um, we started in 1937 instead, the, the beginning of the Sino Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II that was the basis that led, the collapse of the Republic of China was what led to the revolution that was why this exodus took place. But so I needed people who could carry, you know, tell me enough of their story that would carry me through. Now that we're talking about 10 years there. And then I also didn't want to just stop there. I wanted to talk about what happened to them because this was a, an exodus and a diaspora. People ended up going places and what happened to them when they left. And so, um, so that narrowed down the field quite a bit because not everybody had stories that could really carry me through there. And, um, and then also, you know, the average age of the people I interviewed at the time that I was interviewing them was probably very late 70s or early 80s. And that would have made them around 20, uh, in their young 20s at the time of the revolution. I interviewed people who were younger than that but they had childhood memories. And so that would be different. You know, the experience of a 10-year-old is different from a, the memory and the uh, uh, reflections of an adult. And I wish that the, somebody, researchers, had begun interviewing 20, 30 years earlier than that. But so, so these four were people who had incredible memories. 
I mean, they had all of those details. They could, they could draw me a picture of the diagram of where they lived as a child and then the successive places. They could tell me in great detail what happened to them and give me their emotional content too. I mean, that's part of it. You know, you're living through war, you're seeing terrible things. Benny, one of, one of the four, his father was a collaborator with the Japanese. He was with the losing side, his family. And so you can imagine in Shanghai, they lived the, you know, the, they were part of the elite of Shanghai society. They had every caviar, aged scotch, you know, cigars, porcelains, everything that could be looted from, you know, the uh, nationalists who fled, they had. And of course we know how that war ended. And um, his father was on the losing side. Benny's family ends up getting booted out. His father ends up in prison. And I, at some point, have to ask Benny, what was it like visiting your father in prison, a traitor to you know, your country? And, um, and Benny, well, he didn't tell me on my first visit with him. He didn't tell me on my second, third, or fourth interview with him. It was probably my fifth year of interviewing him. And, and that was another thing. They had to be patient with me. They had to tolerate, you know, uh, and being, be willing to share these things. But he told me, I said, you know, at some point, how did you feel about your father? And he said, he was my father. I loved my father, but I hated him too. I hated him for what he chose that destroyed our family and also was so harmful to China. And so these were people who had those reflections. I wanted to also have a range of people's experiences. So, so I had two boys and two girls because of course gender and living through war and revolution and fleeing is different from a, you know, a, a, a female point of view and a male point of view. The, you know, they all went through incredible hardship, but it's still a different perspective and different things happened to them. Um, I well, want you. You brought up an interesting yeah. point that you talked about how Benny had lived with caviar and the life of of wealth and privilege. Do you think, or did it cross your mind as you were writing this book that you might receive criticism because you're profiling the stories of people who who are in were considered or portrayed as an elite class of people and why would anyone care as part of history? I think there was even something that you said yourself in one passage about um, the young girls who left for Hong Kong to escape, that they were there as pampered Shanghai princesses. That some were. Some were, right. But did you feel that there might be? Well, so, of the four, I really wanted to get a diversity of backgrounds, too, in terms of wealth and privilege. So Benny was the privileged one, his family. Um, my mother was a, an abandoned girl. She had nothing. And the other two were somewhere in between. Um, Anwa, whose family, whose father was a nationalist um, official. He was a fighter for the Chinese resistance against Japan. He ended up, uh, he, they had almost no money when she was growing up too because they were always on the run, hiding from uh, the Japanese as well as the, the Chinese collaborators like Benny's father. And Ho was a, a, a family on the run from the countryside. His family owned land. They were a landlord family. But when they were in Shanghai, they also were part of the, you know, the people living under siege. So it was a range. And I really tried to find out um, how many people we were talking about? Because here, you know, this was an exodus at a time of revolution. So it's not like there were a lot of records. Shanghai was a city of six million people, and so um, you know, at, at that time, it was only fewer. Uh, the population was only less than New York City at the time, and and of world cities, it was one of the metropolises of the world. It was it was a, an international city ranking with New York, London. Paris and Berlin and Shanghai. And if you were an intellectual, an adventurer, you know, a bon vivant of the world, somebody like Albert Einstein or Charlie Chaplin or George Bernard Shaw, 
you went to Shanghai if you wanted to know something about Asia. It was the Paris of the Orient. And so um, it had an extreme of wealth, but it also had great poverty. I mean, the vast majority of people in Shanghai were incredibly poor. It was also the, um, the uh, industrial you know, city of China, so there was a large working class too, people who worked in the factories. And so I tried to get a gauge of that, but there was probably about 25% of the population of Shanghai, which would be about a million and a half people, were either middle class, you know, teachers, um, entrepreneurs, writers, journalists. So they weren't wealthy. At the, and, you know, of that 25%, the bulk were middle class, and there was a, you know, a thin layer of wealthy people. But so I wanted to have a range, and I did not want them to be, you know, the, the, the stereotypical way that people think about Shanghai people, those rich Shanghainese, which is almost what the way people look at Shanghai people today. Well, part of the tragedy of this story, too, is that once the exodus occurred, when they landed in strange places, different places with new cultures, new languages, new cities, that they faced discrimination because they were outsiders, which I think you make the point then, assimilation then into this new country is difficult for all immigrants. They suddenly, their, their lot in life, no matter what it was, changed again drastically and they were starting from the bottom. Oh, completely. I mean, this is the thing about exodus, exile, refugees. Today we have a global refugee crisis, you know, and, and the, um, the migrants who come to the border, uh, you know, walking a thousand miles with their babies in arms, you know, are painted as though these are the lowest of the low, the, the criminals who are coming to infect America. Well, you know what? That was the way these Shanghai um, exiles were viewed as well, you know? And the whole thing about history is that migrants and refugees and immigrants at any time in any place are generally not welcome. And the idea that they're all the lowest of the low, the dregs of society, well, one of the things of my book is to, is to track just how difficult the decision was, how agonizing it was for um, every one of these individuals' families, every one of the 100-plus people I interviewed. This was not a, like, let's travel you know, uh, in a fishing boat and maybe die along the way with our babies. Um, and let's just go and do it and then walk to Disneyland, that some people today say, right? It wasn't like that at all. And for the migrants today or any time, it's a debate. It's a long involved discussion. Should we leave? Should we stay? If we stay, what will happen to us? If we leave, what will happen to us? If we leave, where will we go? What will we do? How will we make a living? If we only have enough money for four tickets and our family, our extended family has dozens of people, who goes? And having to make that decision was something that every one of the people I talked to had to decide. Some of them, they took their children and they said they sent them to four different countries. We were talking earlier about that. Uh, other people have had that experience too. Four different countries, why? Because one of them might survive. And that's the same thing today at the southern border. People don't go and carry their babies a thousand miles unless they think if they stay, their children will not survive childhood. If they leave, they might not either, but they might have a chance. And that's the chance that these Shanghai uh, you know, these were, many of them were middle class, they had careers, they had jobs, they had shops, they had um, uh, law practices. Some of them were um, presidents of universities. Others were uh, foot soldiers with the losing side. And they all realized or feared that they would not survive and that their families would not. And that's what drove them to, to leave. Your book is categorized as history of China, but it really sounds like you're saying that this could be a lesson for us in modern day, that you could be writing about refugees from Syria or from Central America in this book. They could be the same characters. Uh, what is the, absolutely. What is the takeaway that you wanted people to look at here? Well, there are a few things. One is that, um, you know what, 
if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. And we are going through a time of crisis that actually, you know, this period of time, mid-century, 20th century, was um, one of the most tumultuous periods of modern day. And, you know, there were refugees not only from China, but also all over, you know, from all over the world. And, and since then, you know, this could have been, there are, there are books, you know, like The Last Helicopter Out of Saigon, or The Last Raft, you know, which there is no last raft now. They are still fleeing um, across the Mediterranean. Um, the last boat to leave, um, you know, Nazi Germany with, with Jewish Holocaust, you know, uh, people fleeing the Holocaust. I mean, the experience of people fleeing uh, a terrible, um, you know, a, a, a terrible nightmare is similar in so many ways. And so I tell the story through four people and their families, and I hope that there will be a connection, a human connection, because we really are talking about, well, what would you do? You know, if this was your family, and we're here in San Francisco or the Bay Area, and we have a life, what would it take to make us get up and run with only what we could carry and not too much money because you weren't allowed to take that or people would stop you or what if the currency had no value? And, um, and all of those things, what would it take for every one of us to do that? Well, so I try to show this issue for, you know, on a human level for every one of the people in my book so that, you know, we might ask, what, what would we do? And, and from there, maybe to make a connection to the other people fleeing other, other dangers today. Is this the first book that's been written here in America in English on this chapter in history in China? This is the only book in English anywhere, not just in the US, yeah. Why has that been? Is it suppression from the Chinese government? Um, well, it's really- Or the reluctance of, as you said, the people who survived all of this to talk and to relive those memories. I think it's a combination of many things. First, that people who survive terrible, terrible times, they're not so anxious to share that right away, and certainly not with their children. I mean, it is the experience, for example, of Holocaust survivors or, or, or uh, families that experienced the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, that it might skip a generation before people are willing to talk about it. I mean, my mother was in her 70s before I think she felt strong enough that she could actually say and face possible judgment by other people. She had no idea how I was going to react by telling me or other people how they would react. And, and I think that's true for any, anybody who experiences such trauma. And I actually think that the World War II generation really, you know, we should look at them and say, you know, that was a generation that was all experiencing PTSD. Now we have a name for it. But, you know, um, is it any wonder then, I mean, his, now I, I think looking at the 1950s and, you know, we say, oh, the 1950s were such a, a sort of quiet assimilationist kind of time for everybody. Everybody just wanted, you know, go to the suburbs if you can and, and just enjoy, you know, hot dogs and Chevrolet and baseball. Well, they had lived through a terrible time. Every one of them has bad memories of that. And so one reason I think it took a long time is because people weren't so willing to just talk about this right away. Of the hundreds of people I interviewed, many of them were telling me, a stranger, what had happened to them for the first time, ever. And I would be listening to these stories and I'd say at some point, that's incredible. Do your children, their grown children, do they know? Does your family know that this had happened? And many exactly times- Exactly like your mother. Exactly like my mother. And many times, some of them would just say, no, I don't think they're so interested. And I would say, no, I think they'd be very interesting. I hope you tell your children. And I think it would have been, that might have been my mother's reaction had I not asked her. And, and I think that's one lesson of this whole thing is, you know, if you got a response like, my mother gave me, keep asking. You know, at some point, they might be ready to tell the story. But so that was one thing. 
Another is that um, this was a pretty big exodus. I mean, we don't know exactly how many people came from Shanghai, but I'm guessing it was in the hundreds of thousands or even if you count those who passed through Shanghai as well in the millions. If you look at the people who fled China overall, it was definitely in the many millions. And um, so when I spoke to somebody in Hong Kong and I was telling them, you know, this is what I'm researching, his reaction was like, oh, the people who fled Shanghai with the revolution, that's such a common story. Now, common. common because Hong Kong was one of the easiest places to get to, relatively speaking. The border was wide open up until 1949. Anybody who was Chinese could pass through Hong Kong without question. After 1949, the British colonial government started imposing um, ways of, of stopping people. But up until then, so a lot of people fled and, and they could swim, you know, many swam across, you know, to get to Hong Kong even if, the British colonial government stopped them. And so for people in Hong Kong and also Taiwan, it was like, really, what, what's the big deal about this? Everybody knows people who had fled. So that was another thing. I mean, in a way, it was such a common story that people didn't think it needed to be recorded. And then another thing, I'll just say this, is you talked about the Shanghai people. You know, some of you here, how many of you have a Shanghai background? Can I see, oh, a number of hands. <laughs> Well, you'll know that people from Shanghai have a certain reputation among Chinese and Chinese Americans, right? It's like, oh, those Shanghainese, those arrogant, big mouth, show off, Shanghai people. Really? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and yes, and so I think there's a little bit of a, a, a you know, a, bias uh, you know, toward Shanghai people. Like, why should you tell their stories? They're perfectly capable of telling their own stories, whether you want to hear it or not. And so I think that was a reaction. And, and so you know, we're here in San Francisco with one of the oldest and most notable Chinatowns in America. And you know, of course, this was the Guangdong run, the people from southern China, you know, from Hong Kong and, and southern China who, who uh, first you know, um, settled, made homes, uh, carved out, paved the way for other Chinese who followed. And so among the, um, the Cantonese people, the Guangdong Ren, they definitely have, a, you know, a, a very different culture than the Shanghai people. And so when I interviewed people from Hong Kong about the Shanghainese, one of the things they, they would say is oh, like, oh, those Shanghainese, they take credit for everything. And, and I'd ask them to explain a little more, and they'd say, well, you know, the thing is this. A Shanghai person with one dollar acts as though they have a hundred dollars. A Guangdong Ren, a Hong Konger, with a hundred dollars acts like they have one dollar. <laughs> and so right there, very, very different attitude. And so, um, so when I wrote about the people who, who fled to Hong Kong, there was such a culture clash. And, and also the Shanghainese who ended up in Chinatowns like San Francisco in, in the U United States, there was also you know, major culture clashes. And there were marriages that came out of that too, but you know, a lot of, let's say a lot of sparks as well. I have one other question, but because the library is going to close and we want time for people to say hello to you and to sign your books, um, how about a couple of questions? Do we have any? Otherwise, we could go on forever. Yeah. Maureen? I'm curious. How did you decide mm. what to read? There's a, there's a mic coming your way. Hi, I'm Maureen. I'm just wondering, how did you decide what to leave out? You referred to starting earlier, your editor said no, but, but what else? I don't mean people, but subjects, topics, part of the journey. How did you choose? Well, Maureen, thank you. Maureen is a very dear friend and a noted journalist, and she is writing a, a book herself, a family story, about um, related to Shanghai and this time as well. Um, so that's part of the painful part for a writer, right? You can't make it a thousand page book. And so, um, so some of it is how you structure the story. Um, you know, I knew I wanted to start it at a certain point. So finding the common points for 
the character. So one reason I started it uh, on August 13th, 1937, was that was the day the Battle of Shanghai began. And it began the next day with the bombing of the International Settlement and the Bund. How many of you have been to Shanghai and are familiar with the very famous Bund, right? The, the waterfront buildings that look like they're a postcard from Europe and not from Shanghai. So this, is a, this was a common experience, all of them. And for those of you who have been to Shanghai, the Peace Hotel and right there, bombs hit the top of the Peace Hotel then, the Fairmont Hotel today, and many, many people died. And by the racetrack, which is now um, People's Park, another series of bombs fell and 2,000 people died with that. And so it was a, a watershed par point. And so part of it was just figuring out how to tell the story that would also bring in as many of the um, individual stories that, you know, that could kind of carry the, the, the story. And I have files and files of things like, you know, cut, missing, you know, um, um, you know the, the cutting room floor, just stories of people. There were so many great stories. And, and one of my biggest regrets is that um, there were, I couldn't have everybody's stories in there. And uh, I tried, but that was, that was really part deciding what the story arc was going to be and what fit in it and what didn't. And it, and it was hard, it was very hard. Another question? Did you find as the author that you needed to kind of fill in the blanks to keep the narrative moving? So um, filling in the blanks was, there were two parts to this book. One was the individual stories of the of the the four main I call them characters, but they're real people. Um, the four main characters, but I also had a lot of I guess I would say cameos, you know, anecdotes from a lot of other people that helped move it forward. But the other part that kept the story going was the history itself. And so the filling in the blank I, I would say is describing what you know. We all know December seventh, Pearl Harbor Day. As Americans, you know that stands out. What that what happened in Honolulu, but in Asia, across the international dateline, it was December eighth. There were multiple bombings that took place throughout Asia, including Hong Kong, Shanghai, you know, many other cities, Singapore, that took place, you know, almost at the same time. And so, um, being able to make those connections was really, uh, you know, the history was in many ways the glue that, that you know, um, between the two of them, there was no lack of, of uh, ways. I didn't feel that I had to be creative to fill in the blank because the uh, challenge was having too much to fill and, and how to keep it compact so that it wouldn't bog down the readers. I actually, may I, may I just ask one other question, just as a follow-up? You mentioned you were in Hong Kong, and I know that you also recently went, since the book was published, to Shanghai and Beijing. Is your book even being sold there, and what was the reaction from people when you showed up? You so, weren't kicked yeah. out, obviously. No, I was a little worried, <laughs> um, because... Um, you know, the book's title is The Last Boat Out of Shanghai, the epic story of the Chinese who fled Mao's revolution. Now, when we came up with this title almost two years ago now, um, you know, U.S.-China relations were in a different place than they are today, and it really just, to me, was a description. I think that was a little naive of me because Mao's revolution in China, they perceive that as an American way of being, you know, criticizing China. Mao's revolution, you know, that bad Mao. Well, you know, I, if they read my book, they'll, they'll know that, you know, this was actually much more of a criticism of the Guomindang, the nationalists, than of the, the communists. But in any case, um, I did a book tour starting here in San Francisco, went around to different studies in the, in the uh, different cities in the um, US, but the book is about China. So there were some book festivals, literary festivals. One was in Shanghai, one in, in, um, in Beijing, and I thought, well, I have to take it to China. 
And so I got invited to, you know, do book talks in Beijing, um, Shanghai, and also Hong Kong. And then I found out that the Chinese government was not going to allow my book to be distributed in China, which, of course, creates a little problem, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to get there and talk about my book, and people aren't even going to be able to get it. Well, weirdly, and so I'll just let me just say that um, uh, Leah, my my spouse right here, who is Leah, can you stand up? Leah, okay, she's frowning, but <laughs> but authors don't write books by themselves. They really need you know the support and um, um, knowing that they have a home to go to, you know, after twelve years and things like that. But so Leah and I went to to China with uh, creatively with more luggage than we normally would take. Let me just put it that way. And um, because officially it was not a, supposed to be. And we weren't sure whether, you know, we'd get stopped at the immigration and customs, but we weren't. And anyway, um, two bookstores, one in Beijing and one in Shanghai, actually carried and sold the book. They, too, had creative means of getting it. Uh, anybody who has access to Amazon or some other online bookseller can get the ebook in China. They haven't blocked that, and they're perfectly capable of blocking it. And so, so the book was getting distributed, um, and it and it still is. But that was the reception, and in Shanghai, which was the place where the Cultural Revolution was the harshest, I guess, um, or uh, you know. Some might disagree with that, but um, in, a, in any case, in Shanghai, they were the most nervous about my talking about this book. And so one of the places, they actually advertised it, but they changed the title to um, Four Young Shanghai People Leave and Go to America. <laughs> and so that became the title. And um, you know, other people said, uh, We'd like you to come and talk, but could you talk about your first book about Asian American dreams and not this book? So there's a little nervousness. I mean, it's a it's an anxious time in America, but it's also an anxious time in places like China too. And the the openness that once existed, you can really feel is is getting much narrower. And so that was true for my book, and mine's not the only one. May we conclude by having you just give us a quick list of some of the children of the Shanghai immigrants, because that's in your book, but I think it's a fascinating list. Oh, so I took a stab at just um, almost a random list of who I could think of, but Amy Tan, Maya Lin, um, David Henry Huang, Elaine Chow, who, by the way, sent me, who was the uh, uh, Secretary of Transportation, who sent me a, a note saying, um, you know, that her family was part of this Shanghai diaspora. And that's wonderful because I hope she can carry on the message where she is to say that, uh, you know what, no not, not all migrants are bad, <laughs> and exiles and refugees should be welcomed the way her family was. Um, uh, Stephen Chu, who was a, a Secretary of Energy under Barack Obama and a Nobel Prize winner, um, a number of Nobelists, scientists, uh, engineers, financiers, um, uh, philanthropists, the list goes on and on. And, and that was just kind of a, a random list that I put together. Ch uh, Chancellor Chang Lin Chen uh, of UC Berkeley and you know, so the thing about it is, of this forgotten exodus, um, and I guess I want to say that's another one of the takeaways from, um, uh, I hope, that comes out of this book. It's not that they were the children of Shanghai exiles in particular, why they were so notable. Uh, Corey Yang, um, for example, is a child of this exodus and a number of other people here, but it's not that it's the Shanghai connection or even the Chinese connection, which sometimes with this whole model minority thing, people think, oh, it's because they're Asian, they're so such high achievers. No, it's because, and study after study shows it's because they are the children of immigrants, migrants, and refugees who see what 
sacrifices were made on behalf of you know what their what their parents went through so that they could have a safe harbor and so um, you know whether it's Colin Powell or you know Edwidge Dandicat or any number of other um, Carlos Santana you know of of children of migrants from anywhere in the world that's where the uh, achieve, achievement gene or pressure or whatever we call it comes from and so, so we have a lot of Shanghai achievers, you know, people we can point to who are contributing to this um, American democracy. But that's because they were given the opportunity to be here and to be able to raise their families. Thank you, Helen. Big round of applause. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And I'm happy to say that Helen will be available at the table outside to sign your books oh, and to outside. answer any questions and to okay. thank you herself for coming. But we are so happy that you all are able to join us tonight. And thank you, Helen and Sherry, for being here. Thank well, thank thanks you, to all of you. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Cora. And thank you, library. So, and thank you all. I am going to be sitting out there. You know, if you brought books or you bought bought books, either way, I'm happy to sign them and, uh, and continue the conversation out there. So thank you so much.